So, uh, hi. <clears throat> Shall I take over uh, Reshma and Prakash? Um, How do we say no? <laughs> <It's> your... <laughs> well, I, I don't see uh, Christina yet. She just sent me a private message ask, asking to be reminded. Do you want to just ping her and ask her to join? She is on the room, uh, in the room, and ah, uh... uh, good, very good. So, uh, 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 do you hear and see? Oh, here we are. There you here are, Christina. Are. So wonderful to see you. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, so, first of all, I mean, it, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be moderating a discussion among such stalwarts, such incredible people. I mean, some of whom I know for many years and some whom I'm just meeting now for the first time. <clears throat> uh, before I introduce my speakers, I just wanted to <clears throat> set a little context uh, in place. <clears throat> the power of social norms. <clears throat> we know that um, norms are hugely important determinants of human behavior. Um, I mean, I know that, that nudging and so on have become intensely fashionable over the last uh, several years. But if you were to really look at the determinants of human be behavior, you are led to thinking about formal institutions, legal institutions, or informal institutions, which are essentially social norms. And the bulk of the burden of governing human behavior I dare say, particularly in countries like uh, India, developing countries, where formal institutions are relatively weak, social norms pick up a, a, a lion's share of the, uh, the responsibility of governing human behavior. In much the way that we want nudge units in the country, I think we should also have norm units. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and to that end, we have extraordinary speakers here. Um, the first uh, uh, person that I would like to introduce is indeed the Richard Feynman of norms, that is Christina Bikeri herself. Uh, <clears throat> she's the SJP Harvey Professor of uh, Social Thought and Comparative Ethics at the University of uh, uh, Pennsylvania, and she serves both in the philosophy and psychology departments. Her initial work has been in the area of philosophy of science, uh, rational choice, and game theory. But uh, over the last decade, or even more than that, she has worked in the sphere of social norms. And uh, she has become synonymous with any discussion on social norms. And as an aside, Christina Bikeri is also the inspiration why we have the first behavioral lab uh, in India. I mean, uh, we, we can we could talk a little more about the inspiration she uh, gave some of us in Pietra Santa one day, her hometown. Uh, but that's for a later discussion. Uh, we also have uh, with us VM Hasnain, who's a very accomplished management consultant. And uh, she, she has worked at the intersection of policy reforms, development, behavior change, and civic engagement. She has led nationwide programs on unemployment, health, financial literacy, and even sports and uh, career planning. She started her career initially at Unilever. She has worked extensively in the MENA region, which is the Middle East and North Africa region. And she has a background from the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, she also has a master's in behavior science from uh, the reputed London School of Economics. Uh, next speaker uh, that we have is Yogita Kaul, another friend of mine and uh, a leader in India who's now helping set up uh, the first behavioral insights unit in the country. Uh, she's a behavioral scientist and she's working as a, a senior advisor at Niti Aayog, which is essentially the planning, uh, the, the planning commission, erstwhile planning commission of India. And she's working on uh, several development indicators at the national level, health, nutrition, financial inclusion, and education among others. Uh, she also has a background in behavior science from the famous London School of Economics. Then we also have Amara Martinez, uh, the Director of Policy Research and Analysis uh, at the Western Cape Department 
uh, of the premier university of cape town so she, i i imagine she is based based out of cape town in south africa she has extensive government and industry experience she has shaped policies strategies and legislation for the province uh, ranging from youth development to other developmental policy areas she leads the bi work in the policy and strategy unit in cape town and she was also once upon a time a diplomat with the british high commission and she's also an economist so i i welcome all of you and in doing so i would also place on record my uh, deepest uh, uh, you know gratitude to reshma prakash and aditya for bringing these absolutely brilliant people on board and uh, i just can't wait to begin the discussion and i thought that we might proceed in the following manner i would like to request uh, christina to start off if that's all right and um, you know she will spend about 15 minutes and uh, i know 15 minutes is not adequate for any of you uh, in in covering uh, all the kinds of things that you can talk about but christina we would love to hear uh, hear about your core intuitions about what constitute social norms <clears throat> conceptually and we would also love to hear how some of those insights have translated into application for instance in india now you're uh, you know you're an honorary indian and so now uh, uh, you're, you're going to come here but i would love to hear that broad perspective and then we will proceed to the other speak so let's start off with krishna bikeri my dear friend krishna bikeri thank you Uh, thank you pavan i'm very happy to be here and that you mention india i'm still working in india uh, covid permitting yes <laughs> and so is a, is a country that's very dear to me in fact so uh, all my work uh, on uh, social norm has been uh, uh, devoted to diagnostics and measurement okay social norm are a type of uh, Uh, uh collective behavioral pattern okay and uh, there are different collective behavioral pattern there are customs there are uh, uh, you know moral behaviors uh, there are convention and there are social norms and so what uh, i always want to stress uh, it, it uh, is that it is very very important to be able to diagnose what's the nature of the behavior that you are observing in order to decide what sort of intervention will be the most appropriate and adequate okay and there are three things that really really matter and that we use in diagnostics and are social expectations uh descriptive empirical expectations so what people think other people that matter to them in their reference network and so we have to measure networks too you know empirical normative expectation what people in the relevant reference network think should be done or should not be done but the third element is what i call conditional preference you can have all the expectations empirical normative etc but they may not motivate you to act in the list so what you have to do you have to be able to show to measure that expectation of a causal relevance on behavior and so all this idea expectation that are basically beliefs and preferences are measurable now in the lab is easy to measure <laughs> you know you change information <laughs> you know you manipulate expectation and see what happens now in the field where i work uh, is much harder and so how do we measure social expectation uh, we basically do surveys and usually we do incentivized surveys because uh, we want people to have an incentive to be accurate okay so they guess in, if they guess accurately they get some sort of prize and then we do lot of vignettes and why do we do vignettes because if i do vignettes and i put you in a situation where you can identify with the character of the vignette but at the same time it's not you <laughs> it's somebody else in a situation very similar to where you are and then i tell you well this person uh, you know think that most people do and most people approve or disapprove or whatever what do you think this person will do 
okay, we measure basically whether there is some causal relevance of, you know, different type of expectation. We also measure how much empirical versus normative expectation matter and so on. And so with this kind of measurement, I can always distinguish between independent behavior, like a custom, very often open defecation is a custom, you know, people, of course, I expect other people to do as I do, but this doesn't cause me to do that. You know, there are other reasons why I do that. And uh, moral behavior too is very much, uh, uh, you know, independent. Okay, what the other people do doesn't move me one way or another, you know, in my conviction, moral conviction. And, uh, but what we are interested in and we can work on are interdependent behaviors. Behaviors, what, what other people do or approve, these approvals matter to you. Okay, this is crucial for the area of norm nudging. Because so what do you do in norm nudging? You try to create a new norm, you can try to change an existing norm, but what you do is send messages. You send messages about what other people do, what other people approve or disapprove of, in the hope that they will have an impact on behavior. The problem with not nudging is sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and it's not really clear why yes, why not. And what I think is very, very important is to do some diagnostic beforehand, before you do norm nudging. Otherwise, you risk spending a lot of money in a really useless way. Okay, this is very, very important. Another important thing to remember that I see so often in my work is the asymmetry in what people infer from empirical versus normative expectation. i give you an example. If uh, I tell you that in country X, most people pay their taxes on time, and I, then I measure, I ask, uh, you know, what do you think people approve or disapprove of? People will also infer that most people in that country approve of pay, paying their taxes on time. On the Opposite side, if I tell you, you know, in country X, most people think one, you know, should pay taxes on time. They approve of that. Now, how many do you think do that? It's not so obvious that they believe, oh, yes, most will do that. Okay, so there is an asymmetry in the messages, in the inference that people draw from different messages. You have to keep this in mind. It's very important. Also, there is an asymmetry in this inference between positive messages, i.e. people do the positive thing versus negative. Think of bribing and you tell people, most people bribe what people, uh, you know, uh, assume from that or most people approve of bribing what you infer from that, etc. This is very, very important to remember. Coming to India, an interesting thing, uh, I'm still working uh, um, for the Gates Foundation doing work in Bihar and Tamil Nadu on open defecation. And uh, we started with the idea that we have to create a social norm of toilet use and how to do that, etc. And what we realize uh, with our work is that it is enough to create a descriptive norm of toilet use. It is enough that people realize that a large percentage of people that matter to them, obviously, in their state, in their area, et cetera, et cetera, similar to them, use toilets. This is enough to induce them to build and then use and keep viable the toilet. Now, the interesting question we have is, okay, once this descriptive norm is well established, will it become a social norm too? Will people start thinking, well, yeah, uh, you know, it is uh, appropriate to do that. It is the right thing to do if they, people, if they don't do that, mm, they are questionable and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing, uh, we have a paper that, uh, you know, we hope will come out soon in which we show basically, if you know, uh, some of you may know all the work that has been done uh, with the acronym CLTS. 
uh, which is uh, uh, work, very good work, done in India, especially, but in Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, Bangladesh as well. Right? Exactly. Yeah. In which uh, they create, basically, they say they create a social norm. And what I discover is that you don't need that enormous effort to create a social norm. You just need to create a strong descriptive norm. And the work I'm doing now, now I'm blocked by COVID, but in Tamil Nadu, we are doing a longitudinal study in which we want to see if the descriptive norm we create is becoming eventually a social norm without much effort on our part. So this is, uh, uh, I, I think I used all my time, <laughs> uh, but basically this is what I wanted to say, you know, uh, diagnostic, measurement, uh, uh, you know, norm nudging, how to do it well, asymmetries, and uh, the importance in our case of descriptive norms. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for that very uh, incredibly lucid and uh, and yet very detailed overview of norms. I, I have, I'm sure a, a lot of us would have questions for clarification as, uh, towards the end. Um, may I now uh, uh, turn to, <clears throat> let me see, uh, Amara Martinez and then uh, request her to, she has a presentation, I believe. And uh, <clears throat> Amara, uh, can you load the presentation perhaps? And uh, we're, yes, uh, we're hoping that she would give us uh, some perspectives on water scarcity, conservation, uh, uh, and, and, and how norms are being leveraged. Uh, Amara, over to you, if, if, if I may. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks so much, Pavan. And I think um, just to say a big hello to everybody um, that's listening and also to my fellow um, panelists. I, I must say I'm really, really excited to be here. And um, I've, I've got a couple of slides, but, but really I want to take you back to 2017 in Cape Town in South Africa. So this was one of our driest seasons and driest winter seasons ever. Um, typically for the Western Cape, we have a winter season that runs from about June to August each year. And normally, you know, we see heavy rains. And so what I wanted to show you and, and just sort of give you a graphic illustration of exactly what that was. So this is a dam called Tiavatas Kloof Dam. Um, it is one of our sort of drinking um, reservoirs that supplies our water to the Western Cape. And you'll see on the top slide, this was in July 2014. You can see the dam is quite full. Um, not the fullest it's ever been, but you can see there is some, some water left. Then you'll see um, there is a year in, in January 2018 where you could actually see, you know, there is this, um, a very dry, almost unrecognizable dam. And you wouldn't even say that, it's, uh, that it is a dam. And, and so what we really needed to think about as a government, um, and our sort of country is, is divided up into three different spheres of government, one being um, the national government, sort of at the top tier. The second sphere is the provincial government, uh, which is where I'm sitting. And then our local municipalities, which is really, you know, where um, they are closest to the people. And we had to think about, you know, how do we actually prevent um, and avoid our taps literally running dry? And I think this is quite important for, for us to, to really think about. And I want to take you through, you know, how things actually unfolded very practically in, in the West and, and in Cape Town. So this slide, you know, just really gives you a little bit of a um, glimpse into what happened from roundabout year, which was May 2017, which is really where our Premier at the time declared the Western Cape a disaster area. Um, this sort of, you know, got into motion um, our mayor of our city government really looking at plans to put into place to really further reduce our water consumption. And so here you'll see that we've, you know, introduced um, re restrictions on water consumption, also looking at punitive measures, um, fines, et cetera, water restrictors in, in our households to really make sure that we were not um, consuming water. And one of the most important things in, in this slide is actually what happened between January 2018 and, and March uh, 2018. 
this was really, you know, where we were looking at round about January, we had the highest level of water restrictions implemented on, on water usage. So from a very practical perspective, we couldn't um, sort of water our gardens, we couldn't fill swimming pools if we were lucky enough to actually have a swimming pool, and, and also we really couldn't wash our cars. So that was really the level of water sort of restrictions that were on us at, at that particular point. Around about 18th of January, our city mayor announced that, you know, if citizens of the province were not going to heed the call by government to really reduce our water consumption, um, we would be sort of going headlong into our, our taps actually running dry. What then happened was the, the city government introduced a very sort of um, interesting and a very controversial campaign, which was known as Day Zero. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this and sort of how things actually un unfolded here. Um, we saw that with the introduction of this campaign, that something changed. You know, this campaign scared the, the living daylights out of everybody in the province. It also really changed our behavior with, with water almost forever. And, and I think this was fundamental. So for us, you know, this campaign focused on messaging as, as one leg of it, but it also focused on a call to action um, to drive behavior change. And, and for us, there were a few behavioral techniques which we used to, to really kind of drive home this, this message of, you know, we had to sort of re reduce our water consumption and, and very quickly. The first was really about normalizing behavior change through honest and inclusive communication with, with our, our residents and our citizens. You know, and I think that in very uncertain times, you know, even such as COVID right now, um, what we saw was that we had to be honest with, with our residents um, in order to be trusted as a government. And I think that, you know, when I look at this particular crisis of, of the COVID pandemic, we, we see that leadership plays a big role in terms of how people re react to messages and, and what they take seriously. And so for us, this was crucially important. Messages about change was needed to be easily understood by everyone. And so what we did here was to really think about, you know, when we're telling people, um, you need to use 50 liters of water per day. You know, if someone told me use 50 liters of water per day, I would be, you know, a little bit confused about what exactly that actually meant. What the city government did was actually, you know, placard these kinds of um, posters all over the city. So in restaurants, in bed and breakfasts, in hotels, we had actually graphically illustrated uh, what, for example, 10 liters of water um, look like if you were going to use a shower. So very detailed things about, you know, when you're going into your shower, put the water on, put your soap on, switch it off, um, rinse yourself again, switch it on. And I think that that was, you know, very instructive for people and really easy to understand. Then we also used, um, you know, issues of, of affirmation of good behavior. So we celebrated when, when people did well. We, we were with them to kind of motivate them to, to do better in terms of water consumption. So this picture over here really shows you, and it's quite small, but, but essentially what, what it says is that for the um, light green buttons, you were actually doing well in terms of water consumption. And you could, as a citizen, log on onto our city website and, you know, see um, for your particular street, what your neighbors were consuming, what you were consuming, and, and how you were actually, you know, getting together to actually make sure that, 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 that you were within the um, sort of uh, consumption um, uh, levels. And I think this was really powerful. Um, the one thing about this is that people were a little bit concerned about sort of privacy issues and, and what this meant. But in the end, I think people saw the value in, in sort of seeing that my neighbors were, were sort of reducing their, their, their water consumption. And this could be equally useful for, for me as well. Then I, I think the one thing that we, we often don't think about is how do we actually infuse humor into what we do? And so this um, sticker here was, was really put up in, in all of our toilets. And, and essentially what it said was, is that if it's yellow, let it mellow. Um, so I'm gonna let you think about that, but if you didn't get it, it's sort of, if you went into a restaurant or a bed and breakfast or, or wherever it was, you were actually given permission to go to the toilet to urinate and not flush your toilet. And so this became something that, you know, if you did flush your toilet, you were almost snubbed. 
And, um, you know, it was pretty normal for people going into toilets. You you kind of go in, you don't flush, you come out, the next person comes in. And, and this was really something that um, drove that kind of behavior change that we wanted to see. And, and so everybody knew at the end of it, for example, that if you flush the toilet, it would be nine liters of water that you're literally flushing down the drain. And I think that this was very powerful in terms of, you know, using human, using you know, how people uh, use their, their behavior in an everyday way to actually get to what we needed them to do. And in this case was, was really reduce water consumption. Then this wasn't part of the Day Zero campaign, but it was a project which my team and I ran, um, which really looked at schools um, being used as a way to, to change behaviors of big communities of people. And yeah, we, we looked at about, you know, um, pupils in schools that were ranging from about 500 to um, to 1,000 learners at a time. And, and the idea was is that we would basically use treatments of competitions and we would look at how we could um, uh, compete between one school and the other in terms of who would actually save the, the most water. So this again started to drive a norm within schools that learners could actually see that water was in fact a very, very scarce, scarce commodity. And, and I think for us, you know, when we look at the lessons of this, we really do see that um, what we learned is that the usual policy response, you know, such as fines and restrictions and, you know, just making, telling people not to do something is not going to imply that they won't do it. And I think that this was very powerful for us. And the second thing that we did find was that, you know, it wasn't one thing that changed behavior. It, it was a combination of things. So the first being, you know, clear and honest communication. And, and the second was a call to action. So for us, this was very, very important in terms of how do we actually change social norms? You know, it was ultimately, ultimately about making citizens realize that if their consumption didn't decrease, then they would be putting everybody at risk. So if you kind of look at the COVID rea re re reality at the moment, it's it's almost like, you know, I'm protecting you by, by wearing a mask and you protecting me. So it's a similar kind of thing. We're all in the same boat. We, we're in this together. And, and this created for, for a powerful sort of change of social norms. Um, it was ultimately also looking at continuously and um, looking at messages, looking at helpful cues and nudges but also infusing um, sort of fun ways of doing things. And I think, you know, as I said earlier, we sometimes take ourselves really seriously, you know, as, as policymakers, as, as people with, within big organizations or even small organizations. And I think that, you know, the, the, the power of humor, um, you know, particularly if I look at an, an African context, you know, we, we have the saying that it's, you know, pavement radio. It's, it's like, yes, you have the mainstream media and newspapers and whatever else, but then you also have this kind of popular culture, you know, so people do listen to that and they sort of use humor as a way of getting through an emotionally trying time. And we, we should really capitalize on that and see how to actually look at the pavement radio to actually make sure that people understand that this, you, you're not alone, you know, like this is the way that we get through things. And, and so the, the one important point is that our city changed its narrative um, from a city in crisis to a city of resilience. And I think that this was very, very powerful for, for us. You know, if, if I fast forward to, the, to today and I'll sort of end on this, um, you know, two years um, to the future year in 2020, it, it seems as though that this fundamental shift um, has completely changed our relationship with water. Many residents, businesses, and even government have permanently adapted their water saving behaviors um, to decrease the impact on the environment. And one of the things that, that, that I can certainly say is that we, we've taken these lessons um, from the water crisis and kind of, you know, shifted it to our COVID-19 pan pandemic in terms of really ensuring that we don't forget about the lessons that we've learned and we basically fuse that, 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 that into everything that we do. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Taban. Thank you, Amara, that, for, for that um, scintillating uh, <clears throat> discussion about what you have done. And I love the points that you have raised about uh, involving humor and fun in, uh, <clears throat> in changing behavior. And I would like to, um, I would love to come back to you and ask how one might uh, reconcile humor and uh, norms. Uh, and maybe even Christina would have a, a view on that. 
Um, may I uh, now uh, invite Yogita Kaul, my colleague from Delhi, um, the leader of the uh, the new behavioral sort of movement that's emerging within the government, to tell us a little about variations in context uh, in India. India is a is a huge, huge country, and uh, it, it's it's like Europe. And there is a tremendous variation in context. And because there's tremendous variation in context, there's tremendous variation in norms. I would love to hear from Yogita about how, uh, uh, as a policymaker, one needs to negotiate that variation and how we can, at the same time, economize on what we can do uh, in terms of decluttering, in terms of keeping the message simple. May I request Yogita to, uh, to make a presentation? Thank you, Yogita. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mamidi. Uh, firstly, you know, let me congratulate the organizers of the event for um, such a tremendous uh, lineup of speakers. Uh, I, I especially feel really, really privileged and proud to be part of this uh, esteemed panel, especially um, moderated by Dr. Pavan Mamidi, who I absolutely love working with. Uh, so thanks a lot to the organizers. Uh, Dr. Mamidi, uh, what I would like to do is I want to talk about social norms and I think some of the points that I'm making would um, tie into what Dr. Christina was earlier talking about and then I would bring it into the Indian context and into from the larger global global context and also touch upon uh, some of the variations the diversity that you talked about within India. Uh, I have a presentation which I'd like to share so give me a minute to get to that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, so the topic I have, and I would like to talk about is social norms, context matters. Um, and I want to start with, um, my personal story and, uh, explaining about what, you know, some, some of the things that Dr. Christina was earlier talking about. Um, so this story is about, uh, being a social drinker. And uh, I think my friends and colleagues in the weird part of the world might be able to relate to this. Um, I had been an a teetotaler for about 35 years of my life until I started working with a, in a British organization. And the culture was to hit the pub. So obviously, I was a little awkward of standing there with either a glass of apple juice um, or a glass of water, which I had to sip all evening. And in the end, um, I gave in and I held my first glass of wine um, sometime, I think, in 2016, 20, no, I think earlier, 2013, 14. Um, but the point there here I'm take, making is in this context that I'm talking about, um, social norms is what uh, one's beliefs are in terms of the descriptive norms of what the group is thinking what the group is following and I want to be part of the group. Um, similarly, uh, I want to be uh, approved by the, uh, the group. So there is this injunctive norms where um, what what are, what is the group approving and disapproving. Um, so we follow to try and fit into the context, it fit into the group that we are in. This I think uh, leads to most of our behavior. Uh, individually, if we think we have a particular behavior, but when we are part of a social setting, our behavior changes in context of that group. Um, I want to now touch upon uh, one, sorry, I'll move to the slide next. Yeah, I want to talk about another story, which is um, the story of the Arabian babbler. And why I'm talking about this is uh, Dr. Mamidi did not uh, share this earlier, but in my earlier sort of career, uh, I was a human resources person. And as a corporate human resources person, I was really fascinated by these little creatures. Um, the Arabian babblers are being studied by um, Professor Zahavi in Israel. These babblers are found in the Israeli desert. Uh, desert and uh, they live in extremely uh, tiring, dry conditions where to survive they have to flock together. And uh, these little birds, when they flock together, have a social order where the alpha male um, is responsible to guard the, um, the, the flock at night uh, and they take turns. 
Uh, and then there is the beta who supports the alpha. Now, this alpha and beta dynamics, you know, there's a constant fight between these two alphas and betas, uh, small little battles, which eventually the alpha wins. Uh, but also what happens in this context is the alpha also, so this, this group or uh, this species of bird also shares the food. So the alpha feeds the beta uh, and not just feeds, sometimes they feed them down their throat, they push food uh, down their throat. And when you think about this behavior, it seems like this is altruistic behavior, you know, where people, where uh, these birds are trying to help each other. But in reality, it's about maintaining the social order where the alpha is supporting the beta. So the beta stays close to him, which uh, the professor calls, in this case, he calls it to be um, some sort of a credit system within this, this uh, group of birds. Uh, or prestige state status. And I wanted to bring that into context because again, you know, what Professor Mamidi said, there is a legal um, angle to social behavior where uh, law and order is maintained and there is a certain behavior. And a lot of our, uh, lot of our uh, day-to-day -day behaviors, a lot of the social order is maintained and the, the burden is ultimately on social norms. And sometimes these social norms are built through the dynamics of the society and how the society communities are built. And I wanted to bring that into context. Um, next, I want to talk about uh, context matters in terms of um, the choice architecture or infrastructure, if you will, you know, and here I'm trying to bring in the difference between, say, um, a city of Burlington in the West and uh, a city of Delhi, where despite of us being as big and large, uh, not having the infrastructure for, say, the bicycle, bicycling lanes do not encourage us to cycle to work. Whereas in rest of the world or in the Western world, uh, this is pretty much encouraged. In Europe, it is pretty much encouraged. So one of the things I strongly feel is um, infrastructure in that sense, the context of um, the choice of doing an activity, doing uh, taking an action uh, sometimes does matter. And over a period of time, might be able to build the norms of certain behaviors. Uh, Dr. Christina may be able to uh, shed light more on this, but th these are these are my strong feelings about how you know how eventually societies would change. Um, I do want to touch upon the Indian context of Swachh Bharat again. Uh, Dr. Christina mentioned about it, talked about it. Um, in this context, again, you know, the, there were about 100 million toilets uh, constructed in India since 2014 till date. Uh, this is the data as on today from the website of Swachh Bharat. And um, if you really see uh, uh, in, in 2016 alone, in two years, open defecation uh, was reduced by 26% in the rural areas. Um, that was a huge achievement. And uh, if you really think about Swachh Bharat, the infrastructure, taking care of the infrastructure was giving a tool, an ability for the rural society and even the urban uh, uh, poor, the, the ability to use those facilities and uh, eventually reduce the open defecation. However, um, there is one aspect that you know we do realize that has happened. Um, like uh, Dr. Christina mentioned that open defecation is a conditional preference. People prefer to do it for a certain reason. Despite of having these toilets, there was um, there were some studies that said you know people are not using these toilets, and the reasons are not the norm of or the habit of open defecation, but the other norms which were stronger than. Uh, this new descriptive norm that was being created. And the other norm was um, sometimes the men and women, let's say the father-in-law and the daughter-in-law, were not comfortable using the same toilet facility. Um, some of the families felt that um, having a toilet would mean, you know, cleaning it. And the burden of cleaning goes on to the woman who's already burdened with a lot of work that she's doing for the family. Um, and so some of these uh, despite of having the infrastructure, uh, creating a descriptive norm, a lot of communication, there are still pockets where 
open defecation continues to be um, a mission in where you know we need to we still need to continue working and changing um, the behavior um the behaviors in open defecation dr mamidi is not very different between the urban and the rural sector the the, the i think contextually what happens is it is easier for a person in the village to go out and defecate in the open because there are larger fields um and uh, the act of open defecation is not as visible as compared to the urban settings and so when in the urban settings community toilets are provided the chances of they getting used is much higher than community toilets in the rural settings being uh, provided because there is an al alternate for them to use um i will move on to another example where i want to again bring in um, this context of international versus india um so in india uh, almost 10 children uh, one in 10 children uh, between the age of 5 and 9 years are pre diabetic uh, uh, and the cns cnns survey of 2018 1819 sorry 1718 also tells us that 1% are already diabetic um also 5% of our adolescent are overweight uh, plus a recent 2019 uh, unicef study or on state of children also reports that half of india's children are malnourished so the nutrition malnourished and double burden of nutrition problem is really huge and the long term effects of it are large uh in the indian context when we go uh, uh, when we when we try to solve a problem that is related to children's malnourishment uh, our focus is pretty much on the icds services or the institutional network of delivery because that's where the largest impact will be and today you know about 13.77 uh, la uh, lakh which is about 1.3 million or 1.4 approximately million anganwadis serve hot cooked meal every day to children the facilities are stopped right now um but uh, uh, they 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 will uh, resume uh, over a period of time but the same thing in context of um, same thing in context of a scandinavian icelandic country is very different where you know to solve the obesity problem uh, they had to tie up with the private sector and that was completed uh, i'll make the last point and then wrap up my uh, presentation uh talking about changing norms and why i brought these two pictures and these two eminent personalities on my slides is uh, 1963 was when sir martin luther king gave his uh, speech famous speech um, and that uh, started a movement and changed the norms about discrimination about the rights of um, a section of the society similarly uh, shrimati savitri bai phule who founded the first indian girls school uh, was in 1848 um those these individuals can be called as the norm entrepreneurs which is what caste sunstein calls you know someone who raises up the hands fights for the rights and then a ripple effect happens um uh, but despite of these things happening so long ago even today you know there was a black lives matter protest in the us so the change despite of it happening um changing these norms uh, it, it, it's a long process uh, similarly with girls education we are much better than what we were maybe a decade or two decades back where only 4% of our girls are out of school at this point of time in the primary uh, level uh, however the, there is still a lot of work to be done in the higher secondary level as far as girls education is concerned so this is how you know even even though we would like norms to be changed through a push uh, a nudge some kind of an action sometimes norms have their own organic way of functioning um in my view uh sometimes they happen suddenly like the pandemic has pushed us to work from home and most of us has uh, very naturally learned to work from home so i would just leave with that thought that you know norms changing norms is a long run process and we as as uh, policy makers need to have the patience and the concerted effort to continue working on those uh, with that i'll wrap up thank you so much dr mamidi
Thank you, Yogita. Th thanks for that uh, very insightful uh, discussion on uh, how context matters. And I love that example that you started off with, which is uh, uh, how you started drinking in the UK. Trust those British to to, to spoil the rest of us. But it, but, but <laughs> the jokes apart, I think it very nicely illustrates uh, the concept of empirical expectations that uh, Dr. Uh, Bik that, that Christina talked about. And uh, I, I'm going to uh, ask Christina uh, one or two questions about that as we go forward. But you can't complete a discussion on uh, social norms without empirical expectations. We'll come back to Christina, but before that we have another outstanding uh, speaker, uh, Vayam Hassanein. Hassan forgive me if I have pronounced your name uh, uh, incorrectly. Uh, perhaps you can tell us, um, but I would love to uh, get your perspectives on how social norms um, have uh, been a part of your sort of policy toolbox in dealing with employment and unemployment issues. Over to you, Vayam. Sure. Thank you so much, Doctor. And I'd like to add my voice to everyone else who's commended really Pavan and the team and Prakash on such an outstanding job and a great lineup. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak amongst these speakers. All right, let's get into it. So today I'm going to share some lessons, uh, some failures as well from which we learned regarding unemployment norms. And this is both from my primary research and my observation of what's taken place within the GCC. So there are five pre-COVID lessons and one I think we've all discovered the COVID lesson of working from home. So let's get to it. The very first lesson I learned when I was just about to graduate from LSE, I was a very excited behavioral scientist and I wanted to tackle a cause that probably Yogita is familiar with, which is recruitment bias given her history in HR. And I noticed that there was a bias against the in-group. So the nationals were being differentiated against when it came to private sector jobs, specifically within finance. And so I ran a diagnostic study and understood where this was taking place and proved that there was actually a bias. But then I ran a replication study. So there were two legs to this. One was a replication of a cognitive study that included a uh, explanation or an introduction urging the recruiter to keep in mind that they should not be biased. And the other one was a contextual intervention wherein we had positive stereotyping. So there were statements such as nationals are effective, nationals are efficient, and they had to see those prior to being exposed to two different resumes. At the end of the study, I was very happy to learn that one of them had lowered the bias against the nationals by 10%. And that was the contextual intervention and the positive stereotype. However, the instructions didn't move the needle at all. The reason there is a lesson here is because if I had at the time looked into the social norm, I would have realized the norm within this country was not to read instructions. It was to skim them. So effectively, I had wasted a whole intervention when I knew that the social norm was up against me. So please do proceed with caution for those of you that are working on replication studies. The second learning revolves around the narrative. Now, as behavioral scientists, we love to tell others that everything that we explain behaviors with is really just a narrative. Well, there is a narrative behind social norms. And through observation of an automobile company that was facing an issue in hiring mechanics from the local national context, I saw that they ran a campaign and it was above the line, lots of spending as Christina had mentioned, but unfortunately it didn't move the needle. Now the campaign was extremely salient. It used catchy messaging like who said that there's a shame in working and lots of people recalled it but there was very little movement in the change of the behavior. A couple of years down the line, the insight or the narrative behind this lack of behavior came to light. And it was that actually the locals weren't taking up jobs of mechanics, not just because of the social stigma and people looked down upon them, but because they thought when they graduated and they became mechanics, they would not be able to get married they would not be able to be the breadwinners within their home. And eventually they wanted to work for themselves. 
So with this insight and the understanding of the narrative, the same company ran an initiative that helped a mechanic take charge of his career and really put in goalposts and career planning. So a mechanic after five years owned his own garage. That did change the needle and changed in behavior. The third lesson is when we're looking at social norms, it's important to identify which sector we're looking at, which city we're looking at, because it does differ. Now, when it comes to the wage gap across every country, this debate has taken place and the GCC is no different. So in one of the GCC countries, there was recently a study that ran on the pay gap in the private sector companies. And it found that for every dollar that men were paid, women were paid 90 cents. Not that big of a deal. However, another study that ran a few months ago showcased that the difference in pay was actually 60 cents to every dollar. So what was the difference? The difference was one was averaging out the entire sector and the other one looked at the problematic companies within certain industries and they were able to identify where the gap was. And once we identify the issue, then we can come up with the interventions as Christina had mentioned. The fourth, and I know this is usually a very heated debate, revolves around paternalism. In non-weird countries, it is, not, it is not strange for paternalism to be put into effect and for policies and quotas to be set by the government when it comes to unemployment. And this picture is of a woman in a retail store purchasing something from a cashier that happens to be a woman. For those of you who haven't lived in Arabia, this probably seems like something perfectly normal. But until 2013, in one of the Arab countries, women could not work within the retail sector. And in order to change this and to decrease unemployment, quotas were put in place to increase the amount of women within the sector. And today, almost seven years later, 50% of the national workforce that works in retail is comprised of women. That change could not have taken place unless there was a paternalistic policy. So sometimes it is the right thing to do. And the fifth lesson is to ensure that your decision makers' norms are known. And I believe this has also come up before, the knowledge of expectations and beliefs is very important. So I got a call a year ago from someone who was publishing a book and wanted interesting stories from the GCC region wherein we had applied behavioral science tactics that had worked. Very excited because I had recently run a trial with a nonprofit to help disadvantaged youth in career planning. The problem was that they had been absent in attending the classes. So to lower the absenteeism, we ran a trial. It included messengers, uh, norming, we used communication to give them FOMO if they missed out on the class. It was actually a really interesting intervention. And it was successful in lowering absenteeism by 6%. So with all of this excitement, I called up the CEO of the nonprofit and said, hey, we can feature this in the book. Would you like to take part of it? To my shock, she said, it was a failure. What are you talking about? It was only 6%. Success for us is anything above 30%. And of course, I had to have the conversation about how in behavioral science and small scale trials, what we look for is understanding and 6% is not bad, et cetera, et cetera. You get it. But in this case, decision makers norms would have been very useful had I set them up front. So this is another case where out of failure comes a very important lesson. And the last lesson, which I'm sure most of us have learned given COVID-19, is that disruptions can change the norm. Back in 2013, working from home is something that the policymakers were looking to include as a package of policies to motivate women to take on roles. Today, working from home is something most of us have had to do for the last four to six months when we were in lockdown. So just to recap, those six lessons were ensure we replicate with caution, always be mindful of the norm, ask what is the narrative and the story behind the norm, 
Look into potential paternalism and if that is required. Investigate the right sector. Ask yourself and your decision maker, whether they're, policy, whether they're policy makers or otherwise, what the expectations are so we're clear on the norms. And keep in mind that sometimes there can be disruptions. Thank you. Sorry, you, you, I was on mute. My apologies. Thank you so much, Vim, for uh, a very insightful uh, uh, talk. Um, I, I would, it, it would be great to hear a little more about uh, the ethics of using things like religion and paternalism in extracting the right behavior, uh, but in terms of long-term consequences and so on. These are debates that, you know, uh, that rage through uh, some of our policy making. And uh, I know that in the short run that they are very effective, uh, uh, but I mean, you know, are there any long-term consequences that we, uh, that we need to be uh, worried about? And I'd also love to follow up on uh, your idea of success, what is success from a policy maker versus what is success from an experimental behavioral science point of view. I think that's also something that I would love to hear from you. Um, may I uh, start off the questions? I mean, we're doing uh, phenomenally well on the, uh, uh, on the time. Um, for, may I start off by asking uh, a, a question uh, uh, to directed at Christina. Let's start with Christina. Um, so Christina, one of the things that, I mean, one of the key sort of intuitions, one of the key concepts that you, uh, that you talk about is this whole business of empirical expectations. Uh, you know, how a knowledge about what others are doing somehow seems to be impacting what we end up doing. That, that's, that's the sort of my uh, rudimentary understanding of a, a really sophisticated concept. And there's also this other uh, related uh, question and thought that I have, and that is, this is sort of a rational choice approach to thinking about norms, as norms as expected costs on uh, prescribed behavior, and that, you know, uh, you know, when you do a bad thing, your neighbor punishes you with, with something which is sort of a rational choice, which is almost sort of a Gary Becker's kind of an approach to whether the punishments are in excess of the benefits or not. And I know you challenge that. You challenge that with your, you know, with your uh, understanding of empirical expectations, etc. My question to you is, how do, what is the sort of the pathway by which empirical expectations work? Is it imitation from an evolutionary point of view? Is it following the herd? Uh, is it an economization of producing my own new knowledge and I just follow what the herd is saying? How does it work? Can you say a little about how empirical expectations work, Christina? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. This is a very important question because there is a lot of confusion about that. And that's why I say doing diagnostics is very important, okay? And distinguishing between social norm, descriptive norm, and other stuff is important. But how we do that? Okay, sometimes uh, um, when I want more information because I am uncertain about buying a refrigerator, <laughs> what do I do? I go on Amazon, for example, and I look at the brand of what I want to buy, and I look at comments of people. I look, and consumers do this more and more and more. So sometimes there is an information reason why we look and we care about what other people have done are doing or saying, okay? So it's called in psychology, informational influence. And very often empirical expectation uh, respond, you know, to the need of informational influence. This is one thing. The other thing uh, is uh, what they have called uh, normative influence, which is different from normative expectation. And some of you gave uh, some interesting example of that. And normative influence means, uh, I really want to be part of that group. So in my school, I think I am a teenager, I wish I were <laughs> again, you know, all the kids have tattoos. And uh, 
I want to have tattoos too. I feel I want to be one of them. And uh, this is, uh, I'm quoting uh, uh, great psychologists, Deutsch and Gerard, who invented the term inform informational and normative influence, okay? However, uh, and normative influence means basically, I see that they do tattoos, I want to be like them, I do, I do that too. This is very different from a social norm approach because whether I do the tattoos or not, these people will not really care. You know, they will not punish me if I don't do the tattoo. They may think, well, you're not really part of our group, but it's more myself punishing myself for not doing that. So informational and normative influence are part of descriptive norms of what I call descriptive norms. In a social norm proper, we also need empirical expectation because if I don't think most people do that, why would I do it? Why would I pay tax if I think most people don't, okay? But the normative is important because social norms exist to bridge a gap between our, if you want, uh, individualistic, selfish uh, instincts and collective welfare. We would not have social norms if we were always in line the individual and the collective, the individual and the group. And so in the social norm, the empirical is important, but the normative expectation is also important. Sometimes there will be sanctions. Sometimes when they are very old, internalized, well-established, you don't need the sanctions, but still the normative expectation is important. But when you think of empirical expectation, you have to be very able to say they are important, why? Because people want more information, because people want to belong, or because people need to know that most people do blah, 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 uh, and approve of that in order to behave like them. So you have to distinguish all these different, um, if you will, reasons. What I always say is that the problem with non nudging is a black box approach. Input, messages, output, behavior. What happens in the middle? God knows. Well, <laughs> we have to open it. Okay, that's my, my answer. By the way, I have a question for the speakers. Uh, Very that good. Super Very good. Please, please, if, please. May I? That's yes, wonderful. of course, please. Um, Amara, I love the information about the 50 liters of water and how to use them. And I think there are many occasions in which we could do something similar, like using electricity. You know, how we use electricity at home, we have television, we have this, we have that, but we don't know. We really don't know. If you ask me, had you asked me, how do you use 50 liters of water? I would say, Bo, <laughs> maybe water in the garden, maybe showering, I don't really know. So I think uh, the lesson here is very important to give people on many occasions where we can do, it makes sense to do that, information about, you know, how much you use something and the ways in which you use it. So I, I was really very happy to see that. And now another question I have, uh, you, you do very, very, thi very many things, information, the school water competition, the spatial water map, and so on and so forth. Uh, which one do you think was more powerful? Did you try to, uh, to distinguish them? Um, I, need, I think we need to do longitudinal studies. We need to know in the long run what works and uh, what doesn't. But do you have an idea of which one, in your view, was especially powerful? Thanks, Christina, um, if I may, Pavan. So the one thing for me, and, and, and I'm curious that, that you've asked that question, because, you know, when you're in a time of crisis, um, the last thing you're thinking about is which one is going to work better in the end. You know, it's kind of like you, you're iterating as you go. And, okay. and so you're kind of, 
you, you kind of saying, okay, fine. So fines and regulations and all sorts of restrictive measures are not working. Okay, what else can we do? Then you go on to, to the next thing. And I think that, you know, as we went along and we saw that, you know, things just weren't working. People were not changing behavior. They were thinking that this wasn't actually a problem and it doesn't affect me. And I think your, your point earlier about, you know, people need to resonate with something in order for change to happen. And if it doesn't happen, you can forget about it, you know. So they're going to always do what they've always done. Um, and, and that's just, just the way it's going to be. And I think that one of the things, if I look back, that 50 liter poster was probably where things changed so fundamentally. So the first thing was about our, our city mayor saying, you know what, um, she was basically, and, and this is a personal view, kind of, you know, having a go at the residents of, of Cape Town saying, you know, you, you guys just are not interested. You don't care. You know, like we are going to run out of water and, and no one cares. And, and so people started to, I mean, I certainly took note of that. And I, and I thought, you know, this is the, the time where I need to shift my behavior. And so much so that, for example, I mean, if I give you a practical example about how things changed. So we were in the shower. We had a bucket in our shower, which we stood in. So we caught the water from the shower in the bucket to basically water our plants. So this was really about changing such a culture. And, you know, this became like the standard thing. So often you, again, very really practical, brush your teeth, right? And so then you let the water run and that's perfectly fine. But actually people were now turning their taps off to say, I'm not going to actually do that because I know that that might be one or two or three liters, which may be saved. So, you know, for us, if I were to say one thing worked, that was the one thing where the messages were clear. Um, the hassle factors were taken out, you know, so we we often it comes back to to the arms pre, um, presentation about, you know, we need to really understand um, what precludes people from doing things, make it easy for them. And you'll be surprised how easily people adapt, you know, and and create this sort of new social norm of like, you know, going to the toilet and not flushing it. Like, I mean, come on, that's disgusting. But it's, you know, for us, it was like we had to do it because if we don't do it, um, there's a bigger sort of consequence that waited for us. And, you know, one of the things that was also powerful and, and we talk about electricity. So we have, and I'm sure many African countries and, and other countries in, in the world have periodic blackouts, um, which is basically where we have power outages. And one of the things that was quite clear is that Losing electricity is one thing. You, you can live without electricity, um, but not having water is something that you cannot do. Yeah. And, I, and I think that, you know, people, if you're thinking about a climate change um, sort of lens on, on, on things, is that what we saw was firsthand what climate change can do and how powerful it is. And if you don't sort of look after your resources, um, things will run out. And you need to basically change your behavior in order to make an impact on, on the world. And I think that that is something that, you know, we, we often don't take to heart and we often don't take seriously enough. Um, so, yeah, so I think I'm not sure if, you, if, I, if I answer your question, but I think the most powerful was, was that 50 liter. I mean, it's, it's, it was something that, that still exists today. So, yeah. Thank you. That's a, thank you. That's a very clever intervention. Thank you. May I ask the other two? Please, please, please. Uh, yeah, please. I love them. Yes. Uh, so I don't know if I pronounce it Yogi Takaul. That's right, Yogi Takaul. That's right. Okay, uh, so I think it's very important to stress context. And very often in the black box approach, context is not included. <laughs> okay. And context means... Uh, also, as uh, uh, William Hassan, Hassan, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, William, as you, uh, as you said, uh, okay, a context may mean that there are other specific norms, okay, behind, you know, certain behavior. For example, with the uh, uh, toilet use, uh, you quoted the fact uh, that men and women may feel uncomfortable, 
using uh, the same toilet. And women may feel upset because typically they have to clean the toilet, etc. However, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think it's interesting uh, uh, to know, again, I'm talking of Bihar and Tamil Nadu, I'm not talking all over India, but we found that over 90% of people who own a toilet, a functioning toilet, because we check that the toilet is functioning, you know, we don't just listen to what they say, we go and look, are using it, okay? Uh, so people, uh, men and women, women love toilets for obvious reasons, but men having them, uh, you know, use them, uh, use them too, even in the countryside. I think the big issue in the countryside is money because the, the government program pays you after, okay, you have built the toilet. And if you are very poor, it's very hard, you know, to get a loan, uh, you know, to maybe you get a loan to a very high rate of interest, etc. So I think uh, poor people should be more helped. Yes. Even if uh, a double pit toilet, after all, doesn't cost that much and it's very, very useful. But still, I think there should be some form of financial help uh, for these people. So I agree with you completely context matters and context may mean infrastructure but may also mean other social norms other habits other something that direct the behavior in one way or another which is related to the new behavior you want to support and last but not least you talk of trendsetters of norm changers okay uh, and one thing i i write about that Actually, the last chapter of my book, Norms in the Wild, is all about trendsetters. And, um, and I'm doing experiments now on them. And the problem with trendsetters is the following. First of all, let me add that whenever I work with UNICEF, the World Bank, everyone, I ask, what well, in that uh, um, situation, were there people that were really helpful, initiating, and they always say yes. And I ask, who are they? Are they community leaders? And they say, no, not necessarily. These are really people who take the situation at heart. So it's very interesting. And we have uh, an article we did uh, in India about Swatch Bharat, you know that, Pavan, probably, and, uh, and trendsetters. From the prime minister to the village people, clearly there have been trendsetters that have helped enormously. Now, the question about trendsetter is, uh, there, must, there must be, speaking of context, the right context. Why? Mm -hmm. Because even if I am a totally uh, committed person to change things, I want to change things, I communicate, etc. The structure of the network is crucial. And what does it mean, the structure of the network? How information spreads in a network and how fast? This is very important. That's why now when I do an analysis uh, about norms, collective behavior, I always study networks. Remember that is very, very important. Norms are properties of networks, not of people, okay? Norms are not my property, are the property of a network within which I am embedded. So studying the structure of networks, because sometimes you may have fantastic trendsetters, but the network is not good. And so everything will die out. So it's very, very important to be able, okay, even to predict that something successful will happen, to know the network and to understand, you know, whether this new information, these new actions can spread or not. And there have been very interesting studies about civil rights in America and how networks allow them to spread or not. There's a nice work by Esther Duflo on how uh, she, where she picks up on networks and how high density nodes and networks are, are able to 
produce change. I'm, I'm sure you know that work as well. And, uh, uh, yes, I, uh, yes. Uh, it's, it's not just Esther. Is uh, you know there are political scientists for many years. Absolutely, that absolutely. Have, uh, you know, preached That's right. <laughs> all That's right. these networks yes. because if you don't, uh, you are getting in trouble. And Absolutely. I am totally converted. And uh, that's what I do. And uh, in, uh, in an article, actually, I use uh, one of the real networks that Esther and her husband identified. Brigitte, yes, I actually, know. Yes, and uh, I, I use that uh, to do a simulation of that. So absolutely crucial. Now, the, the third speaker, again, very interesting. Again, you open the black box <laughs> with all your points. And uh, it's, it's very interesting what you say about paternalism, because there is a big debate about that. Okay. And, uh, you know, especially uh, philosophers are really uh, viral. <laughs> about paternalism. And the issue is, okay, uh, what about doing things that in the long run really benefit people? Because we are myopic beings. Let's remember them. We are not forward-looking at all, okay? So if somebody helps me, okay, better my, objectively, bettering my situation that I cannot imagine I can better now, I can't even see how to do that, welcome, absolutely welcome. And it's not that you're telling me this is better for you. I'm telling you this is better for you. We know that certain things matter, for example, to women, that more economic independence is better, okay? Then you use it as you like, but it's better and uh, more political independence is better and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, I, you know, the word paternalism gives me an idea that I am, you know, putting under your throat, in your throat something that you really don't like or don't want, etc. I don't think this is the case. I think there are big differences between think of child marriage, Okay, working against child marriage in the long run is good for women because they can go to school, because they can become independent. They decide about their life as much as they want. Okay, is this paternalism? I don't think so. That's my opinion. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Christina, sorry, go ahead. Go, go, go on, Yogita. I, I, why don't I, I you respond to uh, Christina and then maybe we'll... Uh, request VM to also respond to the pattern. That that's also something that caught my attention. So I would love yeah. for VM yeah. to sort of respond to the no, the, so, the ethics of pattern. So yeah. Yogita first, you. Yeah. I I completely agree with the, or everything that Do Dr. Christina um, said. You know earlier to me uh, in terms of uh, how we diagnose uh, uh, social norms and also analyze what other factors are influencing results. Uh, and it's it's good to hear about your uh, study in Bihar and Tamil Nadu because yeah. certain small studies give a different result. But it's really, really interesting that you talk about 90% usage. That really talks a lot about how this uh, entire campaign, Swachh Bharat, has been successful. Um, Dr. Christina, I had a question for you where you were talking about networks and how the networks spread and work. Um, in the context of technology um, and uptake, especially the, the, the way uh, the, 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 anything spreads like a wildfire on technology, do you see as a, a scholar that norms are changing faster or unchanging faster than they would have normally because of the uptake and usage of technology? Uh, and is there any kind of analysis where, um, where, the, where we can actually pinpoint how technology can be used to change norms? It's a very good question. Uh, so uh, as a first answer, I would say that technology would uh, uh, speed communication 
make you uh, uh, make available to you okay information that you normally wouldn't have available okay and uh, let people connect and form networks okay that they wouldn't otherwise so in theory these uh, could help changing certain ways of behaving okay one thing uh, that we haven't discussed but uh, is very dear to me and has to do with the media but technology too is soap operas <laughs> Soap operas have been studied by economists. They showed, uh, a, a, in particular, an economist, she was at Harvard, now she's at Bocconi Milano, La Ferrara. La Ferrara has studied soap operas in Brazil. Sugar. And it, um? It's called Sugar. She did it with Abhijit Banerjee. It's an evaluation of, on family planning. Incredible. So yes. the... Um, basically, the women of the age, of, of the generation of the, the protagonist, did change their behavior amazingly and permanently, okay, about uh, birth control, divorce, uh, finding a job, another very important uh, soap opera that had an enormous influence in Latin America was called Simplemente Maria. Mm -hmm. which was uh, um, broadcasted at the beginning in Peru and then all over Latin America. And uh, this is a very poor woman that emancipates herself, uh, buys a sewing machine, starts working, and uh, the sale of sewing machines boomed, you know, with this soap opera. And there are certain characteristics uh, that I study. They can be trendsetters. How? First, because they last a long time and they show, okay, uh, the protagonist with which you can identify it is very similar to you and goes through a lot of hurdles as you would, okay, by changing behavior, but then they win, but they don't win, uh, you know, in a crazy and unrealistic way. They win in a very realistic and hard way. And so people can identify. And the other interesting thing uh, that I notice uh, is that people that watch this soap opera talk to their friends about it. It's a collective discussion. It's not that I'm closing my home, uh, watching television, and I don't talk to anyone. People meet. Uh, uh, I have uh, reports of uh, African villages, but also in India this happened. Uh, you know, that, that, that people talk to each other and discuss it, and so, these spreads. So in this sense, technology, in this case, the media, television, even the radio, have had an enormous influence on norm change. Now, when we think about uh, internet, etc., there is a problem there. And the problem is uh, that people tend to look and watch to things they are already convinced of. And so uh, internet has created something that was already potentially there, an enormous polarization, okay? Mm -hmm. So if I am a Novax person, I will go and confirm my Novax ideas on the internet because I will find tons of information that support my view. And you are against it, you will find tons of information supporting your view, and we're going to the polar opposite. So yes, technology can obviously help, but you know, there may be problems with that. But there are studies uh, about uh, uh, trendsetters and uh, uh, new norm formation in uh, internet gaming. So if you write to me, I can give you, uh, it's very interesting who are the trendsetters and what happens. They did uh, some serious studies about that. Thank you, Christina. Can, can we take a comment from VM on uh, the paternalism uh, comment that Christina made? Uh, because that's something that we debate and we really don't know how to go about it because uh, on one hand, there is the promise of using it. 
very effectively. I mean, for instance, the use of God men. I mean, in India is full of God men and we can use God men to nudge people into certain kinds of behavior, which are good perhaps. But then the question is, are we inadvertently supporting an edifice of a certain kind of a lack of rationality or blind faith and so on? Is that acceptable? So there is a, a serious ethical dilemma. There's a, there's a challenge there. VM, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So thank you both for raising the question. And, you know, there is a debate around the use of paternalism. Let me just set the context. So I was discussing the use of paternalisms to change a social norm and the use of paternalism in a GCC country that is set up rather differently to the weird country. So uh, in this particular context, the social norm when it came to women in retail was that women should not work in retail. Women should not be at the cashiers when they were first asked to do so. There was a lot of pushback. Uh, some of them were called horrible names, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it, she was viewed as committing a horrible crime just by sitting behind a till and ringing someone up, right? Uh, if we take the phasing of the retail sector, it took seven years to get women to be at 50% of the nationals that currently work within the retail sector. And that's about 25% of the sector, that's quite a bit of employment. So over the past seven years, it has resulted in employment, it's better for the economy, etc. And when I say paternalism can work in the right context, what I mean is if these companies were left to their own accord, they would have hired non-nationals because they are cheaper, they would have kept on hiring the men because they didn't need to give them childcare, transportation, all of the extras that are required for the women. However, when it is the law that there is a particular quota or a feminization of a sector that takes place, uh, that forces, lack of a better word, the companies to employ them. And so this isn't paternalism in the sense that I'm taking away the autonomy of the end user. But this is use of, you know, the state's power to actually set certain laws. And I think, you know, even if we think about things like the use of masks now during COVID, you'll see that there are certain countries that are more paternalistic that have turned to certain laws for the use of masks, whereas in other countries, they're politicized, right, when it comes to mask wearing. And so that's the type of paternalism that I meant. I hope that clarifies. I'm not for using... Uh, Un course, unethical course, means, Doctor Pavel. Of course, of course. No, 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 no. I didn't mean. I didn't mean that at all. No, I was no, just, I, know, I know. I was just looking at it from the point of view of the general equilibrium effects of yes, intervention, of course. right? Um, that, that's the only sort that of that is something uh, always to consider. Yeah. Because we are often confronted with the possibility of using masculinity or redefining masculinity as being non-violent against women. But the thing is, are we? reinforcing the sort of the, the, the edifice of masculinity again inadvertently by mm -hmm. doing that. So that's the sort of the ethical dilemma that we constantly have to uh, battle with. So the, I, I think we've come to the end, end of our time. It's been a fabulous conversation. Uh, I'm truly uh, grateful uh, to the organizers. I think they've done a remarkable job in bringing all of you. I mean, this has been a a, a deeply enlightening experience. I mean, we um, uh, Yogita, my colleague and friend, uh, Amara and Christina Bikeri, I mean, the brilliant, fabulous Christina Bikeri, you know, uh, who who took me through a museum in Pietra Santa when we first talked about sanitation in India. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, he, and, and now, so it's it's fantastic. It's, it's wonderful to, it's a full circle moment for me. Um, thank you very much. And uh, we should, I think, continue this conversation offline and, uh, and, and, and learn from each other. And, and I'm sure that I'll, uh, I will benefit from the learning a, a lot more than uh, all of you. Thank you so much. And, uh, and, and have a nice morning or evening. Uh, I, I guess it's morning for Christina. Christina, are you in Italy now? It's You're 5 o'clock. In... It's 5 p.m. No, I'm 5 p.m. Okay, this is a good time to have that I mean, glass I of wine. Santa. And <laughs> you're in Pietra Santa, wonderful. Uh, and Amara and Viam and Yogita, thank you so much and have a good evening, good morning and a good afternoon. And, and the organizers, Reshma and Pratap, you guys have been uh, fabulous. Thank you so much. Uh, best, uh, best wishes and, and big hugs to all of you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Take care. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 B